we never stop to think of the physical form of the book that we are reading. Books have become such familiar objects to us that we almost always take their ingenious and efficient physical form for granted. Books are wonderfully sturdy, portable, compact supports for written and illustrated information. The only external power source they require is light to read them by. They store easily and it's easy to get immediate access to the information they contain at any place in the text. A successful binding structure is subtle and unaggressive in its controlled response to the reader's movements. We rarely stop to wonder how it works, unless it doesn't work. Books as physical objects have been central facts in the existence of most thinking persons for centuries, and they have great emotive power. This copy of the first edition of Poems by John Keats was presented by the author to William Wordsworth in 1817. This deluxe edition of a Balzac story is illustrated with etchings by Pablo Picasso and was published by Vollar in 1931. The emotive power of books can be subtle. Consider this little prayer book from the 16th century, but still common enough. A great many of them survive to the present day. But what if we knew that this volume was the one that Mary, Queen of Scots, carried to the scaffold? Its value as a talisman increases enormously. Old books connect us to the past, the more so because they are still common objects. Everyone has handled and picked up an old book at one time or another. Unlike most objects manufactured several centuries or more ago, such books are routinely available to readers. Go into a museum and tell the curators you'd like to feel the patina on some of their old silver, please, and see how far you'll get. Go into a library and tell the librarian that you want a book from the same period sure. and you're likely to get it put in front of you. A book may last for a long time, but it doesn't last forever, any more than any other object made of organic materials does. Even books made to last a long time eventually get used up. There is a tension between readers and libraries, especially rare book and other research libraries, whose mission includes the preservation of the physical as well as the intellectual book. That is, the preservation of the actual physical object as it has come down to us, not merely a record of the text originally written or printed on its pages. We have an obligation to posterity to ensure that at least some of these objects survive in their original condition. A later facsimile of a book is not satisfactory for some forms of research, any more than a modern reproduction of a painting would be or a modern copy of an old piece of silver plate. Librarians have an obligation to try and preserve at least some of the important cultural artifacts both of our time and of former times for use in scholarship and as eloquent testimonies to the past. The purpose of this presentation is to examine book structures from the development of the first codex to the present, to consider some of the ways in which these books work, and to discuss how we can best handle them now in order to preserve their original physical integrity. In other words, how to operate a book. William Scheide of Princeton, New Jersey, owns this fifth century Coptic text of the Gospel of St. Matthew. Books from the Scheide Library and from the Rare Books and Special Collections Department at Princeton University Library will form the basis of our presentation. The Scheide Coptic Gospel is one of the earliest examples of the Codex form. The Codex, our familiar form of book with gatherings of folded sheets joined together along one edge, gradually supplanted the papyrus roll of classical antiquity during the early centuries of the Christian era. At first it was used along with other book forms, such as the roll or scroll or wax tablet. The new codex format provided protection for its written contents and superior accessibility as well. You could open to any reading location. You didn't have to scroll through. Here we have an Ethiopian Christian manuscript which presents the basic operating features of the codex structure. The leaves are folded together to form gatherings. 
then sewn through the folds, building chains of stitches to form a text block. Note that the outer boards are also sewn on, as if they were outermost gatherings. This early sewing structure is unsupported. That is, no cords or supports are used in fastening the gatherings and boards together. No adhesive has been used. The thread does all the work. A covering is an important component in many binding structures. Here's another example of an Ethiopian Christian manuscript with a wonderfully decorated goatskin cover over the boards, an example of the traditional structure of the early codex form that became common throughout the Near East. Unsupported sewing produces a book which opens flat, as is evident in this detail from a Byzantine mosaic. Surviving early Coptic and other bindings provide interesting evidence of a fertile period of experimentation in book construction. Similar unsupported sewing structures were used in the early European codex binding, though surviving examples are scarce and our knowledge is still incomplete. Eventually, however, another kind of binding structure became dominant in Western and Central Europe, in which the sewing of these books was supported by thongs or cords, which were, in turn, fastened into wooden boards. In this structure, the sewing is supported the individual gatherings are attached by being sewn not directly to each other, but onto thongs passing across the folds. The thongs are then laced firmly into boards, including substantial end bands at the head and tail of the spine. A protective, full thickness skin is then covered over the boards and sometimes decorated. The opening is self-restraining. The heavy sewing supports, that is, the thongs to which the gatherings are sewn, control the opening while still allowing sufficient flexibility for the book to open easily at any chosen point. Its graceful mobility can be illustrated with a child's toy, the slinky. Here, the continuous articulation allows great mobility, but any two adjoining links may only be open slightly. In other words, the mechanism requires restraining action to produce free-flowing motion. The slinky action is apparent in this accurately observed detail in a 15th century Flemish painting. A gust of wind has come through the window grate, blowing out the candle and also gracefully lifting over a leaf of the text. This leaf covers the reader's opening marked by the clasp strap. A few of the subsequent leaves have followed, swinging over in a continuing flow of motion. Look at this model of a late medieval binding. The way in which such structures work are controlled by the binder, but set in motion by the reader. Notice the release of compression as the clasps are unhooked, the force moving through the boards to the text block via the sewing, the continuous and smooth action of the various components during the opening motion, and finally, the closing motion, locking the book back into a geometric solid and protecting the text block as the clasps are again attached. Watch how the boards seat themselves into the shoulder of the text in this cross section. The swelling, caused by the presence of sewing threads in the folds, is compensated for and matched by an inner bevel. This inner bevel seats securely to the text block, assuring transmission of the closing leverage of the boards. Then, in the final closing motion, the outer bevel tightens the lace supports, drawing the back into an elegant arc and changing the text into a solid form, which is then secured by the clasps. In its undeteriorated state, this binding operates itself in the hands of the reader. It is indeed a self-preserving structure especially suited to binding folded parchment leaves and protecting them against changes in temperature and humidity, and equally suited to binding books in paper, a material which became common in Europe in the late Middle Ages. Western European medieval books were made in a variety of sizes. Large books, for example, with large writing on their pages, able to be read by artificial light and from a distance. The size and weight of large books meant that they had to be read at a desk or lectern, suggesting the use of protective bosses on the covers to prevent abrasion of the leather or other covering. 
This book was meant to be stored flat or on a sloping surface even when not in use. The bosses protected both the upper and lower covers from wear while resting closed on a shelf and while open for use. Okay. Books like this would, perhaps especially in academic institutions, routinely be secured to their reading desk or lectern shelf by a chain. We are accustomed these days to storing books upright on shelves, but bookcases designed to accommodate books which are stored upright seem to have been an invention of the Renaissance. Note that this 12th century book has no projecting squares. The boards of the book are flush with the edges of the pages forming the text block. Books without squares became uncommon by the 15th century, but this sensible structure, allowing support to be shared both by the cover and text block, reappeared in the 19th century with the antecedents of the paperback. Some medieval books are smaller, books for the hand. Most of the surviving examples are from the later Middle Ages, perhaps reflecting an increasing non-religious use of books outside the cloister. Their construction is such that the smaller books will not lie open without restraint. They must be held as the leaves are turned. These two actions occur together, frequently by the use of the reader's two hands. This mode of handling can be illustrated with this model of a 15th century girdle book. The motions aren't that dissimilar from the way we read a modern paperback where the book has to be held open, but not necessarily flat, with both hands and the pages turned. The size and construction of the girdle book and the modern paperback alike make it obvious how they are intended to be used. The best medieval bound books are sophisticated examples of book engineering. They rely for their mobility on sound structure, the apt choice of good quality materials, and on solid workmanship. The binder of this book had more than a thousand years of tradition behind him, a tradition which had accumulated diverse constructional features so that by the 14th century there was a wide structural repertoire for him to choose from. Medieval books were time consuming to make and some of the materials from which they were constructed were expensive. But the texts of the books produced during the Middle Ages were frequently on religious and other subjects thought of as timeless. In general, the physical books produced during this period were intended, like their contents, to last for a very long time. The coming of printing in the mid-15th century immediately began to make books more common. The range of their subject matter became more diversified. They were routinely printed on the increasingly available paper rather than animal skins, and were issued in an ever wider variety of sizes and prices. Though still relatively expensive, printed books were cheaper than manuscript books. You might even own enough of them to need to stack them differently on the bookshelf. Some owners wanted their books splendidly and permanently bound. These volumes of Horace were bound for Louis XIV. But many other persons, especially in academic and scholarly communities, were willing to settle for less elaborate and cheaper bindings. This copy of Virgil, for example, was owned by Luther's friend, the theologian Melanchthon. A separate binding trade emerged and expanded in size in order to take on the ever-growing number of books to be bound. It became a highly commercial and competitive business. Trade binders increasingly found that earlier structures were uneconomical or impractical. Especially from the 16th century onwards, binders cut costs and achieved higher productivity by gradually abbreviating or eliminating earlier structural features which had been intended to strengthen the book or to articulate movement and transmit leverage through the boards to the sewing supports on the spine. Though the basic or generic features of book structure were retained, sewing onto supports such as cords, lacing the cords into boards, and covering in leather, vellum, or textiles, performance and durability of books tended to suffer, not only because of structural alteration, but also because of a decline in the quality of materials used. None of these changes in leather binding were particularly obvious, at least at first, to the purchaser or reader of the book. Such changes as heavy spine gluing, sawed in cords, and the use of the hollow spine tube in leather covered work 
culminated in the second half of the 19th century in a refined and handsome, but fragile and impermanent product. Books with stilted mobility made of weak materials. They looked elegant, but they could not last. Thus far, we have been discussing the structure of books in which the covering material was only applied after the boards had been attached to the sewn text block. This structural type, which was associated with the codex format for more than a thousand years, was, however, largely superseded in the 19th century by another structural type. This was case construction, in which the prefabricated cover was attached to the text block by adhesive alone. Instead of building the binding on the book by first attaching the gatherings to the cords, then the boards to the cords, and finally putting the covering material over the boards, binders prepared the whole cover separately, adhering the covering material to the boards off the book and making a case into which the text block could be inserted as a unit. Case construction was found to be particularly efficient for cloth-bound books. The covers could be assembled flat to the bench and then inserted into stamping presses for spine labeling and other decoration before the final joining to their text blocks. Not only was case construction efficient, it was also, structurally speaking, surprisingly adequate for the purpose to which it was increasingly put. The mass production of relatively small, lightweight books intended to be read once or perhaps only a few times. Its light pliant structure was well suited to its intended use. Notice how the spine of the cover springs away from the text block as the cased book is opened. The result is that the book lies open, flat, and docile, easy to operate. With factory-produced cased books, we gain productivity and low cost, although sometimes there is a trade-off between cost and durability. Take the modern paperback, for example. It is printed in large sheets, which are then folded, as with older book structures. But then the folds are cut off, and the individual leaves consolidated into a text block by means of a flexible adhesive. The paper wraparound cover is held to the text block by means of adhesive along the spine. This kind of binding is quick and cheap, though it tends to be neither durable nor permanent, especially if the paper used in printing it is poor. But we may not care. We may have bought it to read once and then give or throw away. As long as it lasts through its first or second reading, it has fully fulfilled the purpose for which it was manufactured and purchased. Ours is an adhesive age. We tend to glue things together rather than stitch, knot, lace, or tack it. In aircraft, shoes, carpets, and in books. More and more these days, we see hardbound books as well as paperback books produced using adhesive construction where a flexible adhesive has been used as the sole means of holding the text block together. Here again, we have a trade-off between cost and durability, and possibly an undesirable trade-off. Unlike our paperback books, we do expect our hardbound books to last. The effect of the competitive abbreviation of book structure over the past several centuries was both favorable and unfavorable for libraries. On the one hand, it produced leather-bound books made of poor quality materials with self-destructing structures. On the other hand, it resulted in mass-produced cloth-bound and paperback books with efficient but fragile structures. In both instances, the long-range effect of the modernization and industrialization of the binding trades was to change the structure of the codex book, tending to produce objects for temporary or casual use. Unfortunately, library use implies a durability and permanence that these structures could not provide. This is a legacy that is most troubling in today's research libraries, whose shelves are full of leather-bound, cloth-bound, and now paperback books in poor or even hopeless physical shape. The simplest way of preserving a physical copy of a book 
is to provide an alternate method of access to its text. Are there modern editions, making it unnecessary to consult rare early editions? Most readers do not need to consult Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe in its first edition, as issued in 1819, with its frail paper-covered boards and spines. Where other recent editions are everywhere easily available, it's only sensible to restrict the use of the original edition to those readers whose research requires them to consult it. Research libraries cannot allow indiscriminate access to these frail objects to readers who, for example, wander into special collections to read Ivanhoe in original boards simply because all of the circulating general stack copies are in use. We must protect the physical integrity of the first edition of a book as originally issued by the publisher and sold by the bookseller to its first reader. If not perhaps all of the copies of the book, at least some of the copies of the book, especially, though not necessarily only, those which have come down to us in good condition. Users can make use of a later reading edition of a book only where one has been published. Where no such edition exists, one option for libraries is to provide the text in microform or facsimile. There are many cooperative library or commercial microforming projects these days. For many readers, microform is not as comfortable or convenient to use as the book itself. But when the copy in question has value as an artifact, and when the researcher's work is not concerned with the physical evidence, common sense requires that the reader be directed to a copy and not to the original itself. One initiative puts modern technology to work to regenerate the collections in their traditional format. Unlike optical disk, microform, or online whole text services, electrostatic copying onto permanent paper can provide a replica copy in the format most familiar to readers and libraries. Attempts are being made to find ways to film or photocopy books without damaging them. But at present, the equipment as well as the necessary process of page-by-page -page image capture are not well adapted to a non-destructive effect on fragile older materials. The requirement that books be flipped over and flattened on a conventional copying machine almost assures damage. One of our problems is that once a book starts to deteriorate, further use may accelerate that deterioration. It may not be possible to copy it using any method without destroying it. Sometimes the physical integrity of one copy of the book will be destroyed in the process of making a microform of its contents. But the trade-off may be a worthwhile one, especially if the existence of the microfilm can be determined by other libraries. In cases where there are no later editions and where the book has not otherwise been copied, research libraries will routinely give the book itself to the reader. But librarians will insist that it be handled in ways that protect it as far as possible from damage. Books which are in a deteriorated state especially larger ones, require support during use. In using these books, pressure on the spine, upright tilting, and even sliding should be avoided. A cushioning pad should be used to prevent damage and facilitate moving. Christopher Clarkson, conservation officer at the Bodleian Library at Oxford, has devised an ingenious system of polyethylene foam reading cradles for various types and sizes of codex books. The individual polyethylene pieces can be used in various combinations to build a support for both tight back and loose back books with either a flat or sloped configuration according to their size and structure. Such an adaptable system is needed to accommodate the various structures and physical conditions of books. This paperback of the 1960s is in such bad condition that it can't be read again at all without destroying it completely. If it has value as an object, 
there really isn't much that we can do except put it into a protective enclosure and restrict its use almost entirely. It can, at least, still be used in an exhibition. Research libraries have necessarily become sensitive to the possibilities and limitations of exhibitions. The Codex book is an inherently difficult object to display. The most basic aspect of its construction is that its leaves are meant to be turned in time and space. But there it sits, static, immobile, and untouchable, in its cradle in an exhibition case behind glass. Libraries are beginning to experiment with 35 millimeter slides and videotapes as adjuncts to their exhibition program. Still, the fact remains that the book is a machine designed to be operated by only one user at a time, whereas some books are almost no longer able to be operated at all. They are just too rare or too fragile. Libraries will always continue to try to provide readers with the original materials they need to use. But especially in research collections, the transaction is increasingly turning into a negotiation in which librarians balance the needs of readers with the durability and condition of the irreplaceable materials requested. It's the professional obligation of librarians, as well as the conservation and preservation specialists who work with them, to be well informed about their collections and to insist on reasonable and proper ground rules whenever a reader wishes to operate a book entrusted to their care.